Welcome to the Tetraki Business Revolution podcast. My name is Rob Yates, and together with my co-founder, Mark Hopkins, we're going to be coming to you at least twice a week with groundbreaking business revolutionary podcasts. In these podcasts, we're going to be bringing to you true business revolutionaries. That's people who've done it differently, done it their way, had success, achieved more than the rest, and are willing to share with you exactly how they went about doing it. As well as that, Mark Hopkins, my co-founder, and I will be bringing you podcasts where we give you information about what it is we're doing to grow a business from one country across five continents in just four years. In this podcast with Lawrence Barrett, we bring you insights into leadership, into how to show up in everything you do. Now, Lawrence has decades of experience and is a global leader in leadership development. He has worked in corporates, he has worked with global leaders, and he now runs his own consultancy business, where he, in his own words, turns leaders into people. In this podcast, you will hear about Lawrence's experience, you'll hear about Jungian studies, you will hear about how we react to situations and we force other people to react in terms of how we see the world. Now, this podcast will help you show up. It will, it will influence the relationships that you have with your family, with your leaders, with your colleagues in all aspects of your life. Lawrence shares exercises that you can do today that will really help you look at the world in a different light. So enjoy this podcast with Lawrence Barrett. This podcast is brought to you by the Tetricky Business Revolutionary Club. Our free to join, no catches, no commitments, no credit card membership program that brings to you twice a month loads of free content, interviews, early releases of podcasts, strategies, actionable content that you can put into place for yourself, your business, or possibly your team to ensure that when your future arrives, it's one that you've designed and that you are truly happy with. To go and join the Revolutionary Club, it's free of charge. Go and look in the notes below in the description, find the link, click on it, or follow revolutionaryclub.tetricky.com and join today. Now, without further ado, let's step forwards into this session's amazing podcast. Welcome to the Business Revolutionary Podcast with myself, Mark Hopkins. Um, we get the opportunity to speak to some incredible people on this podcast. As you know, we've spoken to David Marques, uh, Scott Picken, Robin Seeger, some really fascinating individuals who we read about. Uh, we've read the books, we've spoken to people who've known them. But this podcast is very different for me personally because I get to speak to one of three people in my life who have had the biggest influence on me. And if they phoned me up and said, Mark, come and work for me. Mark, I need your help. I would drop everything for. So this is going to be a little bit of an interesting one because A, this gentleman used to be my boss. So has insights into me that other people don't. And B, has uh, had some interesting conversations about experiments with my child, which will... Uh, which will come up at a later time, I'm pretty sure. But it's, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I'm just, I'm so honoured to introduce Lawrence Barrett to the Business Revolution podcast and welcome him to the Business Re Revolution podcast. Lawrence gave me my big break in 2008 where he tried to change a global organisation by introducing completely different thought processes into into the business and he took an ex-hockey coach into a corporate and I'm not sure if he probably regrets the decision about throwing me into the deep end at HR um, but a hockey coach into HR in the corporate space was an interesting transition but I 
like I said, there are three people who have fundamentally shaped uh, me professionally and personally, and Lawrence is one of those three people. So Lawrence, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. And with a bit of trepidation, knowing how, how your mind works and the stuff that comes out of your mind, mouth, I am really looking forward to, to the next hour. Yeah, th thanks, Vargas. But probably more than I deserve, but I do appreciate that. So, um, Lawrence is based in the UK in Brighton and is going through a heat wave. Uh, so, Lawrence is dealing with the two things that the Brits really struggle with. The first thing the Brits struggle with is heat. We can't do heat very well. And the second thing we can't do at all is a football team where we actually think we've got a chance of succeeding at something. So, Lawrence, just tell me what's it like in the UK at the moment? Well, I've both are combined because I've got a screen at, uh, uh, broadcasting the World Cup right at the bottom of my street on the beach. So um, it's all I hear all the time at the moment. And combined with the heat, as you say, it's, um, it's a little distressing. <laughs> I can imagine it's not, not the two things that you enjoy the most. Definitely not. I, I am a winter person. <laughs> Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go through a little bit of a journey of, of your life and we're going to split this into sort of two sections. One is about Lawrence the person um, and Lawrence has had a fascinating career in both the corporate space, in small business space, in education, um, coaching and um, politics. Um, so we're going to cover a lot of those aspects and then we're going to talk about Lawrence's as a businessman and how he has grown a incredibly successful business globally so we, we can learn but um, just because it's fun I'd love to know your your take on British politics at the moment oh British politics I think I think we're in um politically I think the UK is in a bit of a wilderness right now um we have a government that seems to be hell-bent on alienating every single one of its stakeholder groups um including business um, we have an opposition that is tearing itself apart. Um, but in that sense, we're probably not alone. I mean, I, I don't see a great deal of, of hope, uh, in world politics at pretty much anywhere at the moment. So, um, the UK is, uh, is experiencing difficulties, but you just have to go and, you know, visit another couple of countries and chat to some people to realize that, well, that seems to be happening in most places from what I can see. Uh, and in this, the state that we are in at the moment, what kind of um, opportunities do you think exist for other parties, for other polit uh, political parties? How do you think the next two years is going to manifest itself? Well, I mean, you know, taking a step back, we, we've been through dark times before and there's always a, a sense with um, severe social change, severe trauma, severe difficulty. Yeah, it's very painful, but um, change does happen in those sort of crucible moments. Um, one of my former lecturers, I remember talking about the, the, the Great War, um, and she placed a, a provocation in front of us, which basically said, yeah, you know, the Great War was a good thing, which was quite shocking when you think about it. How, how, how does that work out? You know, 20 million people, however many died. Um, but as she said, you know, it brought about the end of the British Empire. Um, it brought about the foundation of labor movements. Um, it brought socialism into the world. Some people might not think that's a good thing, but certainly a degree of, of social justice is certainly a good thing. Um, it fundamentally changed a, a society in the Western world, which had been kind of tottering along for a couple of hundred years um, and brought about a whole new way of being. You could argue the toss as to whether that's good or bad, but it certainly, uh, it certainly changed things. And I think we're at another one of those very pivotal moments now. Um, we've clearly had a, uh, a failure of global leadership. It's quite interesting, actually. There's a World Economic Forum uh, survey done in I think, 2016, which suggested that 86% of the people surveyed believed that uh, we had, were in the middle of a global leadership crisis. Um, and they listed, I think, the religious institutions were the worst, followed by political institutions, followed by business institutions, and none of them were doing very well. So we do have a problem globally at the moment. Um, and I think the opportunity is that out of that will come new models, new ways of thinking, um, it might allow us to reconnect with what it is to be human, some fundamental questions about that. It might allow us to rethink what is a nation, uh, what is an organization, what is a religion. Um, and I think those are all questions that we could 
probably do with examining in a little bit more detail. Uh, I'm always fascinated by this and I'm going to put you on the spot here just from a, a practical point of view because these questions are not, they're not small questions, they're not questions that you're going to go to the pub um, with the pint and, and, and actually answer and, and make a difference. How do you think in today's society um, would we tackle questions like that? Well, I, th I think in some ways they are small questions, actually. I mean, yeah, at a big abstract level, you know, what is a nation state? Wow, that's, that's, that's kind of difficult to answer and, and probably veers in sort of intellectual masturbation if you really go down that route. But, but what's really interesting is you get to the root of that. The question is, well, how do I want to show up as a human being? How do I want to treat people around me? Um, if I run a business, how do I want to, how do I want people in my business to be? Um, if I'm a parent, how do I want my family to grow up? What sort of people um, does the world need them to be? Um, and then you start thinking about well, what is my civic role? What role do I play in my local communities? What role do I play in um, party politics in the country in as far as I'm able to do that? And I think if we were a little more focused, a little more selfish in a way, as human beings around how we lived our lives, how we actually showed up, um, I think we could make a bit more of a difference than we choose to do. We go through life ignoring um, our impact on our world. You see it in offices. You know, people will get up from their desk and they'll walk to the coffee machine and they'll get a coffee and they won't pay any attention at all to anything around them. They might nod and say hello if someone says hello, but it's almost like a reflex. They're not actually responding, listening, watching. Um, and I think if we're able to do that more, um, we will create better environments and that, that can only grow. I'm just going to share very quickly a couple of ones. One's going to make you laugh um, and the other one's a, a real example in a, in a corporate business I was consulting at. Um, so the corporate business was, um, there was this whole behavior of showing up about being present. Um, and this exec got into the car park, opened his phone up, as we always do, check his emails and read an email that made um, him pretty angry. And he basically had his head in the phone the whole way up to his desk and only realized that he'd walked past four floors of people when the person next door to him goes, good morning. He was like, cheapers. The thing, the thing that I found very interesting about that example is as a leadership group, they then just committed to, to be present. And then as I challenged this individual about what he's just done, I said, maybe this is a great opportunity for you to reach out to your organization to say, I screwed up. Please, can you help me be better? Yeah, obviously he, he he bottled it from doing that one. <laughs> but but still 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 there's some hope there because I think with a lot of people they wouldn't even have asked the question they wouldn't even have noticed that they'd done it. He didn't. He got pointed out. <laughs> that, well, still fair enough. But at least he was he was able to to sort of kind of accept that. You know, that, that, what's really interesting in this for, for for me is that our ability or capacity to notice is very limited these days and I, it's interesting watching mindfulness and presence and all of these kind of fads and you, you mentioned fads at the beginning all these you know that's a that's a wonderful example of a fad and everyone goes on a mindfulness program and i've been in a mindfulness program so what it means is i don't really need to be mindful um i mean there's there's, there's a great truism actually in um in in group therapy that i, I remember from, from my days working in that was um People said one of the best defenses to having to change, if you're a heroin addict, one of the best ways you can have of maintaining your current state is to talk about your addiction. Because then you can spend all your time talking about the value of a heroin addict and not talking about the real questions, which is why don't I change? Why, why, you know, what is stopping me moving forward? And I think it's the same today in, in, in business. We go in a, to a mindfulness course. So we've satisfied our need to be mindful by going on the course. But actually, mindfulness isn't, isn't really something that's particularly difficult. You don't need to spend years meditating. You just need to show up. You need to be aware when you go and get your coffee. You need to be aware, well, who's around me? What's happening in the office? What's the tone? What voices do I hear? Who's standing in the coffee room? Am I saying hello to them? How do I feel? They're just very basic ideas. And we've lost sight of a lot of that, I think, which is sad. It's really sad. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you, you probably won't remember this conversation, but... Um... When I worked for Lawrence, I moved to Vietnam and I worked in the Vietnamese business out there. And the head office is a U-shape where one side of the U-shape office is the CEO's office and the other side is the CFO's office. And I was fortunate in my role to work very closely with both of them. 
and there was I had issues at home. Um, it, I, my son was sick, and I walked into the office in a distracted state and a distracted mood, uh, obviously concerned about my son's health. I then went into the CEO's office, and people saw me going to the CEO's office. Had a great meeting with the CEO, came out, but had a message from my wife that my son's health was getting worse. So after that meeting, I had to go to the CFO's office. So I walked through the head office into the CFO's office, had another great meeting, came out, and my son's health had got even worse after that meeting. So now I am frantic and distraught. Within half an hour, there was a rumor going around the whole business that the business was in trouble because I'd had two meetings. And yet uh, it was nothing to do with the business, it was to do with my son. Yeah. And I, I remember it well. And of course, we you know what often goes through people's minds in situations like that is, oh, they don't, they don't need to be troubled with my personal problems. And so, of course, it's not explained. And then, of course, what happens is they people fill in the gaps. Yeah. Um, and what's basically, oh, shit, Mark's in trouble. You know, we, we need to rally around him becomes, oh, my God, we're all doomed. And we don't <laughs> yeah. know why. It's, um, and it's so easy to do that. Uh, it's um, and I, I, I do think this is happening on a, on a kind of global basis. Um, and if we were able to be more aware of how we showed up, to be more aware of the impact we had on others and, and of our own feelings, actually, um, it might make a difference, a small difference, but it would make a difference, I think. Yeah, there's an interesting one. So based here in South Africa, the South Africans have this, this uh, it's like a, it's a game of tennis they play here. So you, you, you interact with someone and you go, how are you? And then you give your response. And I, I always play this game because uh, I just get wound up because, as you said, no one shows up, no one listens. So they ask you the question, how are you? And they know what you're going to say. You're going to say, I'm fine, thanks. They just know what's going to come. Yeah. yeah, so I, I got started this process, this just journey. I said, I'm fine, thanks. And then straight away, they would come back with, I'm fine, thanks. Well, I haven't actually asked, asked you a question yet. So I used to respond, yeah, I'm not so good. My pet dolphin died over the weekend. And so, <laughs> <laughs> just to see what kind of reactions I got from people and all I got back was yeah I'm fine thanks I was like oh, I'm done I'm having a conversation with you exactly the point exactly the point and that happens on an organizational level this is this is this is how we we end society this is how we live it's it's all it's all one-way traffic and I like again we're jumping around a little bit but I'd just like you to share because um it is probably my favorite strap line of any business that I've ever spoken to, uh, been involved with, or researched on. So Heresy, let's just quickly give us an overview of Heresy Consulting, and then please share your strap plan, because it just is the best strap plan you'll ever hear, ladies and gentlemen. Actually given to us by, by a client, which was, was rather nice. Um, it was something they, they said to us once in, in a meeting. And, and our strap line is turning, turning leaders into people. Um, and that's, that's a very serious, sort of statement really because we we've turned leadership into a, a kind of removed science we've sort of reified it um and we've basically pretended i think over the last 50 60 70 years that leadership can be boiled down to a, a few behaviors relatively superficial which if you copy everybody will somehow be inspired um which ignores the sort of truth of um, human behavior. It ignores intuition. It ignores the fact that people really can sort of see and understand whether you're faking it or not. Um, and it ignores the human. So effectively what you have is a series of behaviors, scripted sound bites, and then the shock and surprise that organizations aren't being served well. Um, the shock and surprise that organizations aren't making money, that people aren't, necessarily motivated and i mean it's, it's funny actually because i always say to people um you know when we talk about this go home and try this with your family script a soundbite for dinner um use the words in the soundbite behave using these particular things and if your kids say to you i don't really understand go well i'm not in a position to to fill in the information on that at this point i'll come back to you for the meeting. do that for a week and see how your personal relationships go see what happens to your marriage and your, and, and and your relationship with your children Try it as an experiment. No one's taking me up on it. And yet they do it at work all the time. This is how they lead. And you think, wow, you know, maybe, maybe if we could just start being a little bit more human, you know, leaders as people, um, we'd probably get slightly better motivated teams. 
I'm pretty sure this is you gave me this advice as well. Uh, if not, I'm crediting it to to your challenging me thought provoking wise. But I was one exec who was taking over a a, a big new sales role, um, and he was chatting to me about how does he connect to his people. And I was like, well, why not interview your wife? and ask your wife to describe you and share with all your sales leader. That's a pretty good way to connect. The poor yeah, man's yeah, yeah, face yeah. dropped. No, but it's, it's quite brilliant. I mean, we did a, a similar thing with Harris. I remember we have a, a questionnaire we share with people, um, which is around what, uh, the questions in it, like what difference has Mark made to my life? Um, and we asked them to give it to their children and their, their, their family, partner, parents, friends, and it's so revealing. And I remember working with an FD um, in India um, who was, as he read his report through, he was just crying because he said his wife, you know, what she'd said to him was that he'd made her a much more confident person and he'd, he'd made her kind of grow into herself. And she'd never mentioned that to him before. And he just thought it was the most profoundly touching thing. He didn't realize that he'd had that kind of impact on her. Um, and then, of course, you, you think about it from a leadership point of view, taking it into work. It was like, wow, you know, how can you best leverage that in your job? Um, wouldn't it be amazing if all of your team said that about you? Yeah. Um, and, and it's we, we ignore these things this is what I mean. You know, we, we, we have these these partners, we have these children and, and they kind of exist in our heads. But how often do we sit there and say, look, what do you think about me? Yeah. You know, how do you, do you sit with your son and go, what do you really think about me? Why do you love and, me? <laughs> Yes. And the wisdom that you get sometimes is amazing. Even from really tiny little kids, you just get these amazing comments and you think, wow, this is, this is profoundly important. And if I can, if I can use this, if I can see this as an aspect of myself that I can, I can work with, you, you've got something amazing. Now, I, it's an interesting way you say that, especially when you're throwing it back in onto me, because it sort of cuts me a little bit deep at the moment, because as you know, I've just got this um, new, coaching role in sport um which is a bit more in the public public domain now and um with a, an eight nine year old son he's able to go to his school friends and say my daddy's a national coach but i now get reminded on a daily basis that my son copies my coaching behaviors on the side of the pitch um <laughs> when i'm screaming and shouting or frustrated at decisions and i'm just like hey what are you doing and then I have to very quickly look at Seth. He's like glued, eyes glued at me. I can see the next time. This is what good looks like, yeah, right? <laughs> oh, it's like, oh boy, you're yeah. never coming to watch me coach again. It's a hell of a problem. But it's interesting, Brilliant. isn't it? Because um, I'm fascinated by this, as you, as you well know. But the, the ability of certain leaders to be schizophrenic. They are mm. one personality at home with their loved ones and their families. And the moment they step out of their car at their office, they have this perception yep. of having to be something completely different. And yet they haven't actually understood, like you've just said, that there's a reason why their wife puts up with all their shit. There's a reason why yep. their husband is going to be with them no matter what. And surely understanding that and leveraging on that in the workplace may get a group of employees to see the same thing and do what that wife does or that husband does as well. Well, we hope so. I mean, I think it's also worth saying that, you know, a lot of people have quite unhappy family lives um, for the same reasons, because they don't necessarily think about how they show up, how the, you know, I, I spend, you know, you might spend hours at work because it's really important to pay the bills at home while your marriage disintegrates because you're not at home. Yeah. Um, and I, I think, again, we come back to this sense of insight, this sense of mindfulness, and thinking about that as a route to exercising good choices. Because I, 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 I'm not sort of saying to people that there is a way to do things. I don't know. God, you wouldn't, you wouldn't take me as a role model anyway. Um, <laughs> Why is that? What I'm really saying. <laughs> yeah, anyway. Um, what I'm really you need to be able to exercise conscious choices through through this this mindfulness, through this awareness, through this insight around how I show up and the work I do. It may be worth sacrificing your marriage for certain types of work. It may not. Is that a conscious choice? Or is that a choice you're making because 
because someone else has made it for you and you never questioned it because you've always thought, well, this is what a boss does or this is how a father behaves or um, this is what a man is in my society. And I think that ability to kind of look inside and go, well, what am I? What am I in the eyes of others? What am I in the eyes of myself? That's the really, that's the really human state. I think that allows us to take leadership onto a different level. I think that's a really good link. There's, there's so many questions. Um, obviously, that's that we will get on uh, later on in terms of the one or two practical things that um, you do with your clients and helping them show up. Because I can imagine that the listeners now are going, God, that sounds, it sounds so easy just showing up. But as they probably reflect and they, we ask them a what were the five people wearing that you walked past on the way to your desk this morning? They wouldn't have a, they wouldn't even know who the five people they walked past were. And actually that in itself is a brilliant exercise. If, if, if everybody who's listening to this, if that's what they did for the next 10 days, they'd start to see the world in a very different way. Just looking at the five people who walked past, recognizing them, what they're wearing. Yeah. Well, while we're talking about this, do you want to, are there any, I know obviously this is um, something that you are an, um, an expert's probably the right word, but also you are a challenger to lots of execs around showing up and you love posing the questions that get people to, it's almost like they're being, we'll talk about your martial arts and your boxing in a second. It's almost like a Mike Tyson punch, the questions that you throw out at people. So um, you've just given one uh, a challenge to our listeners around for the next week just doing that exercise what other things would you would you advise listeners to do to help them start the journey around showing up i mean one of the most interesting things about this is how little we are aware of how we feel as individuals forget noticing the outside world think about the inside world there's a um when we we work with coaches there's an idea called mentalization, um, which is a great concept because mentalization is more than empathy. Mentalization is not just the ability to feel others, but to then build models, mental models of, of why is that true? Why is that the case? So as, as I kind of loosely say to many executives, you know, you need to think, is the, is the person on the other side of the table being a dick or are you making them a dick by the way you're behaving? Um, have you thought about that? Have you worked through the kind of model, the factors that are driving them? So mentalization is really important, but it starts with the self. It starts with you. How am I feeling? How am I showing up? And a very simple exercise that I, 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 I often sort of get people in heresy to think about is literally as you go through the day as a habit, almost as a mantra, name your emotion. You know, you wake up. How am I feeling? Walk into the kitchen, make yourself a sandwich. How am I feeling? And just ask yourself that feeling and name it. Actually try and name the emotion. I feel angry. I feel annoyed. I feel ashamed. I feel guilty. I feel tired. Um, I feel strangely happy. You know, these sorts of ability to notice those emotions will increase your capacity to notice. And if you can notice them in yourself, you can notice them in others. The problem is, in many cases, we put that outside. So, you know, we train people, notice Mark's emotional state, but don't worry about yours, Lawrence. And, and that's kind of weird when you think about it. Um, particularly since a lot of others' emotional states are felt within us. There's a, a concept called projective identification um, in, in psychodynamic work. It was a very simple idea, which is some of the emotions we feel are projected into us. So we identify with projections is, is where the term comes from, from others. So we may feel someone else's emotional state. So if you're more clued into how you feel yourself, Sometimes you'll think, yeah, I, I, feel, I feel annoyed at the moment. I don't know why. And that's a really interesting sort of idea because maybe it is you. Maybe there's something you've missed. Maybe, on the other hand, it's someone else's feeling. And the, these are quite important ideas. There's a um, very good example to bring it to life. When I um, did my last master's, I had to do a thing called infant observation, which is where you watch a baby um for you basically you visit this um this uh, a mother and baby from about two weeks before the baby's born through to about two two years and you visit every week and you sit for an hour and you observe and you're not allowed to take notes you just observe 
And at the end of every every week, you write um, two, three thousand words on exactly what happened. So it's really good training in mentalization. But I remember sitting there once and um, I just became really overwhelmed with this feeling that he, I just felt really confused. And this, this baby was kind of sitting there, he wasn't really doing anything. I just felt really confused. And I, I remember thinking, that's, an, that's odd. And then within seconds, the mother turned to me and said, he doesn't know what to do with himself. Um, and I thought it's, it's a really interesting sort of sense here of confusion. There is confusion in the room, which I felt, and yet it probably wasn't mine. And the mother was smarter than me at noticing it um, and, and putting it out there. But this is why understanding your own emotional state matters so much, I think. So if people can do that very simple exercise, um, it's something, you know, do it for a year, do it for two years and watch what other information starts flowing in watch what associations you make watch what other things you notice about people um, and then you really you, you you've really got it um, well, well we'll carry on that train of thought but i just want to sort of pick up on a very specific part that you've just said there because we live in a society at the moment of instant gratification where we actually don't want to do any work at all we just want all the rewards yeah and i can imagine people who were listening to you speak there and then when you pause around do it for a and they knew subconsciously that you were going to come up with a length of time. I guarantee most people would go a week, maybe two weeks, and then you come out with a year or two years. And it just, it emphasizes listeners, it really emphasizes that in order to make a difference and a change in your life, whatever it is, we're not talking a minute or a day, we've got to actually make changes over years. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think that's really true. You, you, you have to put the effort in, um, you know, whether you're looking at sports. I remember reading Alan Shearer's autobiography years ago, and uh, quite apart from the fact that it was probably the most boring book I've ever read. <laughs> um, <laughs> what was really interesting about it was every page was basically, and I went home and I did 40 spot kicks. And that was broadly the whole autobiography. And you start to think, well, he's a good footballer. Not because of talent, yeah. but because he worked really hard. Um, you look at any of the great artists, you know, the work, the hours that these people put in um, is, is, is incredible. And I, I think if we really want to achieve any degree of personal internal change, any degree of mastery, it takes time, a lot of time. Yeah, and, and I love uh, just on that in terms of time, and I'm sure, I don't know if it's a true story or if it's one of those fabricated stories, but I like the message behind it. It was, it was Picasso in a coffee shop scribbling some drawings on a napkin, and the lady next door to Picasso saw Picasso about to throw it in a dustbin and went to Picasso, can I buy this off you? Um, and he goes, yes, and she goes, how much? And he goes, $20,000. And she goes, well, you've only been doing it for two minutes. He goes, no, I've been doing it for 30 years. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, exactly the point. I'm just going to change because, again, I'm, this is a bit fascinating. I'm going to, uh, because you start talking there about humans and you talked about looking inside and really focusing on, on the inside. Um, you are a member of the International Association of Jungian Studies. And I know over the last um, five, 10 years, this has been a real focus for you to get a real deep understanding of Jungian psychology. Um, and one of the quotes that I know you love is, um, who looks outside dreams, who looks inside awakes. Um, do you wanna just elaborate on that a little bit in terms of personal um, stories and how that applies to uh, all of us? Uh, it comes back to this point of insight again when we if we live our lives focused on what is outside us um we become in a way a shadow of of the outside world you know we may look at our parents our fathers for example and think well that's what it is to be a man that's what it is to be a father that's what it is to be uh, you know authoritative and and we don't see the inside, the internal person. We don't see the struggles they go through. We don't see the, um, the sort of tormented soul of our father. We just see this, this face, this persona. And we pick it up as ourselves and we, we copy it in the best way we can. 
um, or we react against it, which is just basically another form of copying. You know, effectively we become a, an inverse. I'm not going to be like that, so I'll be like this. But we don't really question why. And so when we spend our lives kind of fixated on these, these external, what we term identifications, we, we live in a kind of state that isn't real. Um, we never allow ourselves to really become anything. Jung talked about this idea of a formation of what he called a secondary character. Um, so we become um, a secondary character. We become an, uh, a series of ideas that we've borrowed from other people. And we don't actually spend time looking at ourselves, thinking about what choices that we might want to make um, and the sort of person that we might want to be. So questions like, how do you want your children to see you? Um, have you asked them? The question like, um, what sort of legacy do I want to leave? What stories do I want people to tell about me um, in my organization or indeed in my family? Um, we don't really think about things like that. And as a result, we live a life that isn't really ours. That's interesting. I remember again going back to I think one of the first days I worked for you. You uh, you turned around to me and you said, "By the time you come in tomorrow morning, I'd like you to uh, share with me what your final day would look like working for me." And I had to go away and really think about what it is I wanted to achieve in the role. Um, what were the what were the takeaways? What were the lessons? How would I have grown as a person in that, in that environment, in that space? And I think it was probably one of the best pieces of, uh, of work that I actually probably did for you. <laughs> <I'm selfish. laughs> the rest was rubbish. That's why you got rid of me. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I, I, I think it's an interesting point though, because I mean, even with that, we, it's still a fantasy, you know, it's still not real, but but the, the advantage of, the, of those sorts of questions is you begin to engage with yourself. You begin to start thinking about, okay, if I go into this meeting in this way, what's, what's the outcome going to be? What's it going to feel like? Um, and you can then start to make choices about, about how you behave. I was coaching a guy. It was quite interesting. He was um, senior in a bank. I won't say who or what, or even what role he took. Um, Cause it, he might notice this, but um, he was coaching, he was working in a bank, he's quite a senior guy, and he used to send these funny but brutal emails. I mean, really, really bad, actually. And they were only funny for someone like a coach, you know, to look at him and think, my God, what did you say? Oh, hell. Nobody says things like that. So he used to do this. And there was a really interesting example of he had a, um, someone had failed in one of his, his business units, and he sent this horrifying email to this guy's boss and um it had unleashed all sorts of ripples in the organization and i said to him do you think the person you sent the email to is as much of an idiot as the person that works for her and he said oh no no she's one of the good guys and i said so do you think that she thinks you think she's one of the good guys <laughs> he was like oh Probably not. And, and so if you imagine it's from, a, again, this mentalization, this idea of, of insight from a leadership point of view, he's now alienated, not just the person who really he thought was an idiot and, and may well have been. He's also alienated people who were the good guys, people who were on his side, people who would have supported him. And he used to pick fights in that way with basically everybody hmm. for, for, for no particular reason and the important thing to think about with this is some fights are worth picking some people are idiots to be blunt yeah. some people should be fired but not everybody <laughs> most of the time people don't need that they need a bit of support they need a bit of nurture they need recognition they need appreciation so we we rush to this this kind of caricature of behavior without really thinking about what the impact is going to be. As I said to him, you know, at the time, if you need a public hanging, only a public hanging will do. But quite a lot of the time, we don't need a public hanging. We don't need a hanging and we don't need it public. And it's a real shame that we, we behave in these very simplistic ways a lot of the time. Yeah, a lot of it is driven by the, the perception of things being done to me. Therefore, I need to, to fight back. Uh, and Com completely agree. Yeah. 
Absolutely. And, and that's the, that's my point around, you know, is the guy being a dick or am I making him a dick? Well, the realization that actually, gee, this is my behavior. Mm. No wonder he's behaving like that because any sane person would, if I show up in the way I'm showing up, Oh, how do I think about that then? That changes the way you see your relationship. Yeah, it's my reaction to the behaviors of other people. And that, that my reaction is the one thing I have complete control over. Absolutely. No. And, and let's, Let's be fair, sometimes you can get angry because we're human, that's what happens. Sometimes we, we, we will act out, sometimes we will not regulate ourselves, and that's okay. The interesting question when that happens though is, did you notice it? Yeah. Was your immediate impulse to then go, well, I'm gonna justify why I got angry, or was your immediate impulse to think, yeah, that was a bit excessive. <laughs> um, and sometimes though, anger is okay. There are things that I think it's righteous to be angry about. Um, so I'm not, I'm not coming from a, a sort of terribly passive aggressive, um, sort of, uh, pseudo compassionate style here. You know, I think there are things that I think are, are, are pretty outrageous. I mean, in South Africa, anyone who lived through apartheid and wasn't angry, uh, had no soul. Um, but <laughs> sometimes you have to think, well, probably not this. I mean, and, and it's interesting when you look at the, the kind of biochemistry from it, we respond very similarly um, in all sorts of different stages. So if, you know, and if an angry lion enters the room, your body is going to go through a similar process to if somebody just says the wrong thing after you've kind of woken up, you know, you'll, you'll still snap and respond in a similar way. The difference is, do you see and feel what you've done? And are you able to kind of uh, work with that? To make better choices going forward and it's interesting the power of leadership it's a very silly simple example but every now and again when i'm exhausted i put myself in front of the tv and i on a sundays every now and again i watch the grand prix because there is nothing as mind-numbing boring as watching cars go around a track and it's a great way just to switch your mind off every now and again just to go i'm just going to watch this mind-numbingly boring thing but i was watching the race on on sunday and it was fascinating because there was a leader uh, Lewis Hamilton was leading the race and there was an incident which called for a virtual safety car. Everyone else pitted apart from him. And basically that decision by the team cost him the race. And on mm. national, on world TV, 400 million people watching this, the chief strategist came on the team radio and said, Lewis, I have lost you the race. It is my fault, but I still back you to make the best out of this situation, which I have caused you. That's amazing, impressive, actually. It was, it was very, very brave. Yeah, and it was. Is that that's the word? It's the. But again, this is where I don't believe not enough leaders understand the impact of the reaction to their behaviour is much more important okay. from a longer term perspective than the reaction. So, what will happen? There'll obviously be repercussions and frustrations around the decision. But again, as, yeah. as we all know, the whole concept of attitude and skill sets and, and what's, for me, from a hockey perspective, yeah. I know I can make someone a better hockey player in a shorter space of time that I can yeah. fundamentally rechange their attitude around performance. Yeah. But you see, your example there is a really interesting one because this is another leadership fallacy. Um, if I don't fess up to the fact that I've just lost Lewis Harry Hamilton the race, nobody will notice. Hmm. Um, and they won't talk about it. Wow, that's an interesting <laughs> yeah. thought. Um, I mean, I used, I used to work for someone um, who, whenever we had a leadership um, team sort of workshop, you know, and you do the usual team workshops that people do, so you have your psychometrics and you have your feedback and all the usual, usual stuff that goes on, they, were, they either cancelled it or they were away, or they were, there was always some reason. And I remember thinking, this is amazing because it's almost as though this person believes that if we don't give them feedback, nothing bad is being said about them. <laughs> and I, it baffled me at the time. It absolutely baffled me. Um, because the ability to sort of acknowledge what other people might be saying, the ability to see it and feel it, it's not a weakness. You know, they may be wrong. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying I have feedback is a gift. I take it because some people give me feedback. And I think I just don't care. And I don't agree with you. Um, as you know, but <laughs> and that's fine, but you know what it is yeah. and which allows you to make choices. And 
I think that whole piece there is it comes back to this single point of leadership is all about understanding. You do you understand yourself? Do you understand others? And you're making conscious choices about the decisions you need to make based on that understanding. Because if you don't have that understanding, you're making choices based on an illusion, a, a secondary character, to go back to Jung's phrase, not on the reality of the relationships. Yeah, it's living a life on assumptions of which you have no idea if the assumptions are based on truth or not. Yeah, and you, and you might get away with it, but it might also cause your marriage to fail. It might cause you to get fired. It might cause your nation to go to war if you're a politician. I mean, all of these things can end up backfiring rather badly. Yeah, it was interesting. I did a, I did a marriage course when we were out in Vietnam, and just to simplify this into it, for me, it's just they were talking about the difference of men and women and they simplified it in terms of men see the world through blue eyes, they speak through blue mouth and they hear through blue ears. And women see the world through pink eyes, they speak through pink mouth and hear through a pink ear. It's not wrong, it's just different. And it was just fascinating when we started to discuss finances, I was like, read this through blue eyes. Just to help the dialogue and the conversations around the assumptions that I'm making and not aligned to another person's assumptions. And it's interesting because yeah. if you look at one of the most simple equations around reputation is reputation is your actions plus what other people say about you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the more you know about that, the better. Yeah. Because it's, um, and again, I think the bit that I always look, I want to think about that, that equation. I always want to add something onto that equation. It's not about just your actions. It's how you respond to your actions actually influences yeah. more what people say yes I, I think you're right i think you're right and and there's there's an interesting mix here too because if we think about something like feedback you you give me feedback it says something about me uh, it says something about you and it says something about our relationship mm. so it's if you think about it in those terms you know, you may say, ah, Lawrence, you're, you're too rude. Yeah, to an extent that might be true. Maybe it's because, you know, you're a bit of a snowflake and you don't like me being rude. That's not feedback, by the way. <laughs> um, and maybe it's because actually we've just been through a really difficult um, meeting situation where I overreacted. Or So th there's, there's a lot of complexity in that. And so if you take it simplistically as an either or sort of zero sum game, you either ignore the other person, it's all about you, um, or you kind of become this terribly introspective um, sort of self-doubting character of, oh, I need, to, I need to match what everyone else wants, the external perspective. The real looking inside, though, I think, for me, is not, it's not just accepting a piece of feedback or, or beating yourself about how you are, but it's really looking at this and going, well, how much of this is me? How much of this is them? How much of this is the context? What's created by that? And what choices do I, am I then going to make tomorrow in how I show up? And as we said, that takes effort. You don't just get that by going on a mindfulness course for half a day. <laughs> I think what's uh, the bit I love again is uh, the bit that we don't appreciate enough is context. Um, and you started off this, this mm -hmm. podcast, you were talking about that example of um, having a conversation with your child and then your child goes, I don't understand. And then you respond to me with, well, you don't really need to understand all that information. It's not. Uh, but yeah, we get into these dialogues and these discussions and anger and those kind of situations where our starting assumption is they have all the contents and the knowledge that I am, I have, and therefore I am justified in my reaction because they should have that same context and knowledge coming back. Therefore they're dicks. Exactly. And interestingly, it's so easy to shift the context. I'm reminded there was a workshop. You would have been on this in Vietnam. If you remember the, um, one of the last workshops I, I, I ran, I'm pretty sure you were there. Um, and the workshop was effectively on, um, um, what we might think of as um, as good listening and, and relating. So we spent you know we spent three days working on you know improvisation and connection and good conversation, all good stuff. And there was a very simple exercise which I'll I'll, I'll replay for listeners, but you will remember this. We got everybody to stand up, seventy something people, seventy two people I think, and we said who has the, the biggest feet, you know. So go into pairs and stand no more than six inches apart which they did, which is quite, it's quite aggressive. So you're changing the context immediately. You're creating a very tense 
um, situation. Who has the biggest feet? And someone put their hand up. You are Bigfoot. So you're introducing size and, and hierarchy and, and all of the sort of assumptions that we bring in with that. Who has the littlest feet? Your little foot. And we said little foot make a fist, which is a, a lovely symbol of fist because, you know, it can, means many different things. And so you had people sort of raising their fists sort of aggressively and others making these kind of weak little things and others making sort of, you know, nice little sort of power and solidarity um, sort of fists. And then we said, Bigfoot, your job is to make little fit, foot um, un open the fist. Begin. <laughs> what was really interesting is we'd spent two and a half days, <laughs> two days working on, 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 on good listening and good questioning and emergent leadership. <laughs> and of the 72 people, 36 couples, I think all but about four were fighting yeah, physically. Fighting. They were rolling on the floor. And, <laughs> and, and what was fascinating was with the couples that didn't, one of them had kind of just backed away and refused to play at all. And another one, I remember we said, so, you know, did you ask? Yes, I asked if Littlefoot would open their fist. What did they say? No. So what did you do? Well, I fought them. I tried to force them. And it was this kind of feeling of all you have to do with context is introduce, you know, let's have some authority. Let's have some hierarchy. Let's take the light out of the room. Let's give you some... Um, Let's give someone in the corner with a checkbox monitoring your performance. Let's put a bit of speed and impetus behind it. Um, let's give you a target. Let's reduce the amount of personal space you've got. It's really, really easy to create a context where people behave according to their worst nature. So with that example, I remember that clearly. Uh, I think I was Bigfoot as well. I can't. I use it all the time, <laughs> that one. It's a great example. It was so funny. So... What what is it about us as human beings that straight away go to that default, and what kind of triggers or concepts or things should we we be thinking about as those almost you know those those gates, those fort knocks, those locks that we have to unlock first before we actually get to that that primitive state? Well, there's a it's it's an interesting one. There's a great book I read years ago which. It's not a particularly academic book, but it's a really nice, thoughtful sort of journey. It's, uh, it's called The Philosopher and the Wolf. And, and it's, as you, as you know, then, about a guy who's a philosophy professor who buys a, buys a wolf, and he reflects on, on himself and his alcoholism and, and, and the, the wolf and the nature of the wolf and the nature of man. Um, it's a beautiful book. But what's really interesting about that, he, he suggested that because we're apes, because we are primates, we have no kind of natural dominance. We don't have very big weapons. We don't have large teeth. We don't have big claws. Um, so our survival has been predicated on the fact that we work together. Um, but what's interesting is that there are in a group sort of two places you don't want to be. You don't want to be at the edge. Because if you're at the edge, you know, the lions and the tigers take the sick and the old, and at some point you're going to die. So you don't really want to be there. The scent is also a very dangerous place to be because all the eyes are on you. You have all the power. This is a real sort of leadership issue. And as a, an analyst once said to me, you know, this, you find yourself in a position of senior leadership. Um, you can imagine yourself as a sort of large gorilla. You're in there. You've got all the food. You've got all the power. But in the forest, the suns are waiting and they're going to get you. Um, and what's quite interesting is the rest of us, leaving aside those two extremes, spend our lives in negotiation. We spend our whole time watching what's happening around us, watching the, the primates with whom we share our space. Um, and we then have this really strange, if you like, relationship um, with each other as humans. We are acutely competitive and aware that the person next to us might steal our food, might push us a little further towards the edge. But at the same time, we're acutely aware of the fact that without them, we won't live. <laughs> yeah. It's a trade-off. Um, and that's, that's a hell of a dilemma, actually, for people. So we have the capacity. I mean, if we, if we look at things from a psychodynamic point of view, you've got kind of Wilfred Bion's ideas around group relations, and I'm massively oversimplifying. Apologies to any psychoanalysts who are listening. But Wilfred Bion's ideas, which are quite, it's quite negative when you read them. You know, groups are bad places. And people do bad things. Um, and on the other hand, you've got S.H. Falk's perspective on group analysis, which is, you know, a group is a, is a wonderfully generative and containing and supportive place. And both are true as, as, as ideas. Um, and that's the complexity, if you like, that we have to work ourselves through as humans. If we're able to build better understanding and relationships, 
then we can again make choices about how we respond to groups because groups can be both. You see it in, in teams, you know, you're, you're a coach. Um, you can see teams which just basically tear each other, the, the cells apart in recrimination and blame and scapegoating and, and selfish competition where there have to be stars and prima donnas. And, or you can see teams which are just amazing, just incredible to be part of. I mean, actually on the subject, I, was, uh, I remember I coached um, a guy some years ago um, when we were talking about um, teamwork, he's a uh, Japanese expat. And he, was, he said to me that um, the most incredible experience he'd ever had in his sporting world, he played uh, lacrosse on the uh, Japanese under 21 side. And he said what was most, the best game he'd ever played was he was playing the States and they lost something like 53-4 or something. And he said it was the, the most incredible game I'd ever played. He said because we were terrible. But for the, those four goals, we played the best I've ever played in my life. The team just was perfect. We knew where we were on the field. We knew how to relate to each other. It was as if we didn't individually exist. And I think it's, it's fascinating when you kind of look at teams like that, this capacity to be just connected and this capacity to tear ourselves apart. Um, what, what separates the two? What makes the difference? Yeah, cause I know obviously we, when, um, in the previous world, we talked a lot about the concept of flow. Um, and mm. how that manifests itself in a daily, in a daily basis, and I think that's something that we've been talking about for for this podcast around consciousness, about being a lot more aware of yourself, uh, a lot more aware of your emotions, of of how you are feeling, and those those thoughts and those feelings are being manifested externally for other people to interpret. So, do you want to just share? Because I, I I still talk a lot about flow. I think flow is a it's a really good mm. concept for business owners and individuals to understand that. But you can give a quick summary of, of flow and how it impacts us on a day-to-day basis. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a great model. I mean, and, and I'd recommend the book to, to anybody. It's, um, it's very simple and, and very helpful, which is it, we have to basically find the right balance between um, capacity or capability, depending on how you, how you want to use the term, and challenge. So... When we're in flow, um, things just feel right. Time seems to stand still. And, and this can be in a sporting context, but it can also be in a work context. You know, those jobs that you've had when actually you've been there six months and it's just gone. Mm. And because it's, it just feels good. If the capability isn't as good as the challenge, isn't as strong, isn't as well developed, and one of two things will tend to happen. One, you will start to feel hopelessly out of your depth. You will become stressed and anxious that stress that stress and anxiety will reduce your capacity to think well and because of that you will feel further out of your depth you will uh, underperform um, so if you put me in the the south african hockey team you know this would be an interesting experience because you know i i would i would underperform but in underperforming i would get worse not better um, because the flow experience would decrease the other way you can do it within within this sort of flow experience is you change the nature of the job and you see this happening all the time in business, underqualified CEOs will make the organization a low level underperforming organization to suit their capability um, rather than, than drive it to be something else. So that's kind of one issue. The other problem, of course, we, we see is when people have higher capability than the challenge they face, when they're in, let's say, a menial job or a, a low level job, um, and yet they have capability to do something much bigger, particularly if contrasted with the fact that their boss isn't necessarily as smart or as capable or as skilled as they are, which is, let's face it, a reasonably common phenomenon. Um, and of course, what happens there is a very similar thing. You can either reframe the work by clever manipulation of one form or another, which is quite difficult in some organizations, so that actually you can become bigger, the organization can grow or you'll increasingly get stressed and, and, and you will underperform. And this is a really interesting challenge for people because if you're too big for the job and you're underperforming in it, that's a, that's a burden. Um, but it happens all the time. You know, people who are very smart in jobs that they're not very capable at, and it really crushing and damaging for the, um, for the self-confidence and self-esteem of the individual. So staying in flow, I think, is a, is a really interesting development challenge for people. I think it's interesting you, you use the word performance there and um, it's again it's a bit of a fad word at the moment everyone's talking around performance and 
again, we, we, we don't actually understand, in my opinion, what is the definition of, of performance and actually what we're asking people to perform and what right do we yeah. have to ask that person to perform against the yeah. characteristics and the qualities that we are, um, are dictating to them <laughs> that might not be anywhere aligned to their capability or capacities like you articulated just now. Mm. Mm. yeah and 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 who makes the call anyway and then what is performance what is the judgment against that it's um it's a it's a difficult one it's a difficult one it's easier and, and i feel very uncomfortable actually in many ways by comparing sport with business because um not entirely but in many cases they are quite different animals in that sense um and the analogy can sometimes be a little bit stretched because performance in sport is often easier to measure. Although interestingly, Al Smith, who you, you know, I, I, I made that introduction to you, is saying to me that there's a change now in, in British Olympic sport um, towards a longer term focus on the development of the context in which the sport is based. And I think that will bring business and sport much, much clo more closely aligned. I think what we've seen over the past 20 years is the worst of sport um, has, has influenced business. And I'm, I think we're now starting to see a slight shift where the, where the best of business might influence the best of sport, um, either longer term nation building, developmental. So we'll see what happens. It's a, it's a complex one. That, that's a hell of a thing to get into. Yeah, it's interesting there as well in terms of, uh, again, what are, um, what are the rewards that you are basing your performance on? Um, and again, mm. I think in and what we've been talking a lot about is, is a simple difference between output focus and input focus um, and yeah. a lot of things that you've been talking about uh, today has been around really understanding the inputs and um, another one I'd like to just share which is an interesting one is uh, another one of your quotes that I know you you um, you really put a lot of emphasis on which is the sole purpose of human existence is to kindle a light in the darkness of mere being and that's another, yeah. another young one yes yeah. can you bring that one to life for the listeners um yeah this is this is an interesting one um it's back to it's it's back to this this same refrain about insight the the ability to really see what you are and and what choices you make i'll, I'll let, me, let me bring it to life in the context of a life journey we spend much of our lives um performing against external uh, standards and that's okay so for the first so let's say 30 years of our lives we 35 40 years of our lives in some cases maybe even more um we look at the outside world and we learn what good is we learn how to fit um, and we have to learn skill so you know if you imagine someone like a picasso you look at the work he was doing when he was at university at sort of 15 16 he was a tremendously talented artist he put the legwork in he knew how to draw. He really did know how to draw. Um, so you have to learn your craft. The difficulty comes around the sort of midlife place when that isn't enough. And you have to start thinking about what does this actually add up to? What is the meaning and purpose? Michelangelo produced David the statue at I think about 27 which makes you feel a bit kind of inadequate. But the interesting point about Michelangelo is it's just a statue. It's a very good statue, but it is just a statue. There's nothing much more about it. At 53, he produced um, The Last Judgment. I think he was 53, um, which is an incredible painting for several reasons. One, because it's a very good painting. But two, because it's a painting that, for him, encapsulates his sense of the Catholic faith, his sense of but his own belief and his own sort of religious perspective and thirdly because um he had a number of uh significant challenges with papal authority um which could have you know cost him dearly if he'd stepped on the wrong side of the line um so he took a stance that was very personal he wasn't sort of saying this is what the pope wants me to paint he was painting what he felt he needed to paint because if you imagine those two phases the sort of first phase of life to be able to produce the work of the second phase of life, you've got to know your craft. 
But there does come to be a point where you think, well, how many Davids do I produce? 10, 20? At what point does it get boring to just keep polishing my, my craft? So we're faced with a, a sort of very difficult situation here because on the one hand, if you haven't got craft, my view is you've got no chance of finding purpose, not a prayer. Um, but on the other hand, um, if you only have craft, eventually you'll, you'll run out. You'll run out of meaning. You'll wonder what the point is of doing it. And so Jung's view, I think, is... Mere being is simply accepting the norms and requirements of society. It's about craft. I have to be good at carving statues or painting paintings or doing sport because that's what I'm supposed to do. And that's okay to a point. But to really move forward in life, you have to then start shining a light of insight into that and thinking, well, why do I do that? And what does it mean? What's it for? What's the point of it? So when you think about something like sport, is sport about winning a few goal, you know, winning a few games, making a bit of cash, making yourself feel good? At one level, yeah, it is. I mean, we've all been there. You know, you've done sport as a twenty-year-old, and you think, yeah, you know, that actually all it's about. <laughs> um, you get into your forties, and you think, oh, dear, it's, you know, winning and losing gets boring after a while. <laughs> yeah. um, what's more interesting is what are you building with that? You know, what's the what's the um, what's the impact on the game, the industry? What's the impact Legacy, on the nation? Yeah. Legacy, exactly the point. Uh, and the great study, therefore, of the All Blacks is, is, is a particularly resonant one there. But, but I, I think the difficulty in many ways for leaders is how you keep both sides of that equation happy. Yeah, and I think the challenging thing is what, what you've articulated is how how people overcome their fears, both innate fears and also the fears they have of other people's perception on them. Um, I was going to quickly have one more last question before we start wrapping up. And you're going to, well, A, you're going to laugh because I know again, ladies and gents, there's one thing that you'd have to know about Lawrence is <clears throat> Lawrence isn't, he used to come in every day and look at me and go, what the hell is on your feet? As I always wore the most brightly colored socks just to annoy him. Um, especially pink, <laughs> not a big fan of pink socks. Um, no. But one thing that I've started doing now, and you can, you can find this on Instagram, um, it's the hashtag ZF Wednesday. Um, and if you do it, if you look on Instagram every Wednesday and just do hashtag ZF Wednesday, you'll see me dancing like an idiot on Instagram for a minute. To last Wednesday I did uh, Billy Idol, and I've got a cracking one lined up for tomorrow. Um, and a lot of it is because I want my son to, to see his dad. And it goes a little bit back to what we were talking about at the start. I want, his, I want my son to look at his dad and go, my dad is comfortable in his own skin. He doesn't, he doesn't have a fear of perception. He's not scared of what other people are going to say or do on if, if he does something. He's going to do something that's going to actually, I'm the world's worst dancer, so I'm fearful of being mocked by dancing. But I really do not care. I'm going to do it every Wednesday. And guess what? I've had people come back say, this has made my day. Um, and I just, again, it was just something I had to ask a question in terms of fears. Um, you, you see it all the time. You've given loads of examples um, in your, your coaching work and stuff. But I think in, for business owners, for parents, for human beings in general, we, we're feared and scared of so many things. What, what could you help? What kind of advice mm -hmm. could you give in terms of overcoming fears? Um, someone once said to me that all change is, um, is a series of minor transgressions. <laughs> um, and I, I, I think fear needs to be approached like that. If you think about fear, if you, if you imagine fear, um, in as far as we can ever really imagine fear, um, the best analogy is it's like a, it's like a dark shape in the back of a cave. You don't really know what it is. You don't really have a clear sense of it there are some fears which are very obvious but in a way arguably they're not fears you know no one no one particularly wants to get burned by fire but it's not really a fear it's simply a a rational idea um but a fear is something that's much more than that it's symbolic it's consuming the problem with that dark shape is this it could be one of three things um it might be a large angry bear 
you know, it genuinely some fear you should be afraid of. Yeah. And if you don't take it seriously, it will tear you to pieces and you just don't want that to happen. It may also be um, a small angry rabbit. Um, in other words, yeah, it's kind of a minor problem, but it's not actually such a big deal. And yeah, you'll get over it. Yeah, you probably get a bit irritated or a bit nipped occasionally, but it doesn't really matter that much. Fear may also be a pot of gold. Um, there may be something within the fear. Jung, Jung talked about the shadow of the personality as the as the source of of, of all intuition and ideas. As uh, he referred to it as the gold in the shadow. Some fear may reveal something that will change everything about your life. It will allow you to look at the world in a very different way. It will allow you to build relationships that you hadn't previously thought possible. It will allow you to open up new commercial opportunities. The difficulty though is, how do you tell the difference <laughs> yeah. between those three? That was my dad's question. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the problem. And there is no answer to that. But coming back to my point about minor transgressions, what I would do is always say to people, try experiments. Do something that's it's not going to kill you. You know, go for the angry rabbit. Because if you if you if you test it as an experiment, yeah, you know, you might get into a bit of trouble with your boss, or you might you might lose a bit of money, but you're not going to destroy your life. But crucially, you're also not going to walk away from opportunities. There's a, another great book that I'd recommend to anyone, and um, by uh, David White. It's called Crossing the Unknown Sea, um, and he talks about le he's a he's a poet, and he talks about leaving his work as a marine biologist to become a professional poet which is you know on the face of it the most ridiculous thing <laughs> you can imagine i'm going to take a job that everyone needs it pays well and become a job that no one needs and doesn't pay well but that was that was his journey um and what he always said again very similarly was it's like stepping off a cliff you know you, you you're not just going to step off you're going to find a small foothold just somewhere that you can stand and i i think this is the, the core issue minor transgression Find a place to stand and just, just see the fear. Have a look at it. What does it look like from this angle? Is it as bad? It might be. In which case, don't go there. Yes, um, but quite often you'll discover that, that, that it isn't actually that bad. Uh, and sometimes it opens up tremendously good opportunities. Perfect. Um, we have, and I'm sure we have plenty of times previously gone on for hours and hours conversing. But unfortunately we are... We're coming to the end of our, our conversation and with all our guests, we ask them a couple of questions. Um, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions um, and then mm -hmm. we're going to wrap up, unfortunately, even though I would love to carry on. So um, we've talked about legacy. Um, yeah. thought, so um, you raised the question around how people um, possibly don't spend enough time thinking about their legacy and the purpose and how they want to leave the world. So. How would you want people to describe Lawrence Barrett in, let's say, 30 years' time? 50 years' time, because you're a young man. 50 years' time. 50 years' time. Um, how would I want them to describe me? Um, curious, foolish, um, and kind, I would say. I'm probably one of those three, <laughs> maybe two. <laughs> Depends who you ask. <laughs> Depends who I ask. Yeah, I think everyone would agree I'm foolish. Yeah. Uh, um, what's the one question that you wish people asked you? Oh God, that's hard. The one question I wish people asked me. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that one. I actually don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about that. In 10 years of knowing Lawrence Bat, this is the first time I've asked him a question that I haven't got. I have no answer for. First time in 10 years. I'm yeah. I'm going to go give myself. Come back and ask me again in 10 years' time. I will definitely have an answer for you. But then, but then again, I might not. There you go. It's. I want to remember, actually, I'll just leave you with this thought. If you think about the fairy tales, um, the brother who leaves home with the armor and the sword and the war horse and knows what the journey is going to be like and is ready to kill the troll, as a plot spoiler, he always dies. <laughs> um, Don't tell my nine-year-old son. <laughs> <laughs> the hero or heroine is the idiot. They're the fool. They're the ones who don't really know what the answer is. 
Um, and I think that they're willing to accept the fact that they don't know either. Um, the downside of this idea of turning leaders into people is that we are just people. That's all we are. Mm. Um, and we're all in a way fools, flawed. And um, the only thing I think that really that differentiates us at the end of the final summary is, have we actually spent some time looking inside ourselves? Yeah, it's the question of, of have we enjoyed the journey? Um, uh, I'm going to just I'll wrap up by sharing a very quick story. I was driving through South Africa to Swaziland and I was driving through a valley and I came to the, the valley face and the road goes up this valley face. And it's not always driving in dark in Africa is not always the most recommended thing to do. Um, I, 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 I remember. <laughs> and I was trying to get to this hotel before... Um, before it got dark and I cannot remember the life of me for this hotel, but I was driving up this valley and it was, it was touch and go, where are we going to get there? And at the top of this valley was the pub and it was the pub of all pubs. And as I was getting there, I saw this pub and I was going, this is going to be the greatest pint of my life. As I sit there with my pint of beer overlooking the valley. And this idiot was so fixated on getting the hotel, the hotel, before dark, I drove straight past what would have been my greatest pint I've ever had. Um, and from that moment on, um, it is about ensuring that you stay present on the journey and don't get fixated with the destination. I think you're right. It's good advice. Wouldn't disagree with that. Perfect. So I'm just, um, I'd like to just again, Lawrence, thank you so much for, for sharing your, your wisdom, knowledge, insights, um, stories. Um, and I think it's something, like I said, I've just alluded to the fact that I've known you for, for 10 years. And I, I, I do mean that, that there, are, there are three people I have interacted with uh, professionally and personally who have fundamentally shaped and molded and challenged me like no others. And um, people that if they send emails or phone calls and said, Mark, I, I need help, uh, I would drop everything for. So first of all, I'd like to, to thank you very much for the last 10 years and being that, that mentor, that guiding light, that coach to me. Uh, we all need that. And secondly, thank you very much for giving up your time to join us and share your, your wisdom with our listeners. I'm sure they're going to get a massive amount of insight and value out of your, the conversation that we've had today. So thank you very much. And there we are. What an amazing interview with the phenomenal Lawrence Barrett. Thank you too to Mark for your time for doing the interview. And if you would like to connect with Lawrence, please connect with him via LinkedIn or via his website, heresyconsulting.com. This podcast, as with all of the Business Revolutionary podcasts, are brought to you by the Tetraki Business Revolution Club, our free offer of free business coaching to you and anyone that you know. No catches, no credit cards, and no commitments. Check out the link in the description below. As ever, I hope you have an amazing week going forwards and realize that you truly are a business revolutionary.